Good evening, and uh, apologies for not having the recording up in time before the regular time, but Bez Hashem, they should be able to have this recording by tomorrow morning, by the Arab Shabbos. And Mazel Tov to my son of Remel and his wife Mushki on the birth of a little girl this evening. Should be Gadol the So let's start with our Shia. So first of all, we have the issue of last week we were talking about ending the fast 72 minutes after sunset in Iceland, where <clears throat> according to as a shit of Rabbeinu Tam, it's so 72 minutes after sunset is, is Nacht. And I mentioned that some poskim understand that to be a flat shear of 72 minutes and how I was, I was struggling with it because at such a high um, latitude, it's clear that it's, it's much more than 72 minutes. So one of our listeners pointed out to me after the shear last week, Actually, the same is happening every town is Tzibur, other than Yom Kippur and Tisha B'av, where we have a time when the fast begins. And you look on the Luach, it says the, time, the fast will begin again at a given time, and that time is 72 minutes before sunrise. Now, if you'd start looking at Alos HaShachar, at dawn, According to degrees, it's usually going to be a fair bit earlier. And so you have here an entire community who are calculating the beginning of the fast 72 minutes flat, regardless of the fact that uh, according to the degrees, it should be longer. Now, obviously, there's a difference where it's a glaring glaring difference to the fact where it's not so obvious. 72 minutes before sunrise is quite dark. And so can, you can understand why they go along with the 72 minutes flat. The problem is when it becomes so glaringly unrealistic that you can still read outside, it still uh, hasn't become dark properly. And so this kind of relates to an overall attitude in halacha. Can you paskin according to halacha when it seems to be against the facts as are they are seen to the naked eye? So the one who raised this with me mentioned this a sikha of the Rebbe about the Bircha Sachamo. The blessing which we say once in 28 years for the, uh, the sun being back in the same position as it was at creation. And this is there's two main ways of calculating the length of a year, of a solar year. And one's called Tkufas Shmuel, and one's called Tkufas Rav Ado. Shmuel says that a year takes 365 days and six hours, whereas Rav Ado has got a much more uh, precise cheshpin. And <clears throat> we are calculating according to Tkuva Shmuel, which all of these small inaccuracies have accumulated to a we, one week, two weeks of all, all these centuries. So really our Bircha Sachamo is a couple of weeks after um, what would have been the time of, uh, of, of, of um, the creation of the sun by, by Bria Sa'il. So there are those who want to take the view that it's okay because Bircha Sachamo 
will go with Beruchnius it's at that time, even though Begashmius is not at that time. The Rebbe, does, the Rebbe talks about this argument. For example, when it comes to Kiddush HaChodesh. So what would happen if the Bezdin had been misled? Because the witnesses had, had misled the Bezdin. And they passed Kiddush HaChodesh in a particular way. So the halacha is that, that, that they, 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 it goes according to what Beskin Paskin. It says, it says a lot of atem. And we say, atem afilu shogigim, atem afilu mutoim, atem afilu mezidim. Even if Beskin had been misled, so it, the halacha is like Beskin. The Rebbe actually is not satisfied with that. <clears throat> and it says, it's all very well when you talk about Rosh Chodesh, because Rosh Chodesh is a halacha. So you can say we're going to the halacha is the, the way it's called by Ruchnis, etc. But when it comes to something like Birch we are we are celebrating a fact. And if that fact isn't correct, so we're, we're, we're you know, we're not, we're not really, we're being dishonest, so to speak. We can just read this, and this is in the Lakut Asichus Chelik Tazayin. All in Yon of the Shtein in Torah, Befrat Azachas Vazayin, Vamaisa, Halochal Maisa, Bepoil, things which are in Torah. Is a mikro the Hapsak Din Yoitzi Medep Shuto, Medavk Mekayim Zayin the Halocha Kip Shuto. We have to fulfill the Halocha in the literal way. Choshas Yadr Inyan in Oulon, Befrat in Torah. Is of course everything has got a source in the spiritual level. But we have to follow a halacha as it is the here lemaisa. Therefore, we can't say a bircha sachamo based upon some ruchnis de kechesbin that in, in, in heaven now is the time for bircha sachamo. So the Rebbe there goes through a fascinating chiddush, and he because there's a two ways of calculating whether benison nivra elam or b'shtishri nivra elam. And the resolution of this is that the world was created by Maise, by Tishri, and by Machshove it was created in Nisan. And since Birka Sachamo is celebrated in Nisan, so that's according to the Mahalach of Machshove rather than the Maise. Therefore, since Birka Sachamo has got to do with Machshove, it's okay that it doesn't fit totally to the Maise. That's the Rebbe's Mahalach. But overall, we don't. We, we we don't. We can't. We can't buy this idea that seventy-two minutes after sunset is nacht, even though it's still it's still uh, light outside. It's something which is very difficult to accept. La halacha, and to say that we pass can halacha is based upon ruchnius, um, that doesn't really wash very well. And when you look in the Alter Rebbe, say the birchas anenin. Sorry, sorry, say the Hanos of Shabbos. His language about Rabbi Tam, Shkia, etc., he says, Neged Hachush, or Pliyo Nizgava. Neged Hachush means it's against the tangible senses. We can't paskin based upon something which is abstract. We have to paskin with our senses. And since, uh, so that's the, that, that explains that Loshan. Okay. That the idea that it has to be something which is uh, we can relate to. Let's go on. One of our listeners <clears throat> lives somewhere near the Ukraine and has a problem of lots of flies in their area. I remember when we went to uh, Lubavitch, it was uh, five years ago this time, with the Kinnas Hashluchim in Russia, so they gave us these citronella bracelets. It's one of like a spiral kind of plastic bracelet. And it's impregnated with citronella, which somehow keeps the flies away. So I think the question he was asking is on two points. One is whether it's considered a use of a medicine. And the second one is about wearing them in the street. So there's a question of refuah. And because generally we don't use medicines on Shabbos, unless it is such a 
uh, acute situation, the person is bedridden. But for a minor irritation, we don't use, for minor, a minor condition, we don't use medicines or shabbos. So these are the two questions. So the, the top of what you have on your, on your screen, Misha Motsui, this is from the Sefer Ksosa Shulchan, from Chaim Noah, and he's quoted in the Shemir Shabbos Gelchosa, where he says the following, that where you are suffering from Yetushin, mosquitoes, whatever it may be, which are biting and, 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 and bothering, and on the weekdays you'd normally put on paraffin on your body, and the paraffin would drive away the, 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 the flies. So he says that you're allowed to do so on Shabbos also. So he doesn't, he's not worried about this. It doesn't, you're not trapping anything. You're not allowed to catch flies. But here it's just to keep them away from yourself, is to distance them. So he says that's okay. And it's not a refuah because there's no one ill. It's not a medicine to heal an illness. So therefore it doesn't qualify as that. So once we've gone through that, that it's allowed to be, uh, it's not, you're allowed to wear it as far as refuah goes, what about wearing it in the street on shops? So my reaction was that you have a concept called kamea, which means something which is worn to protect you. And you are allowed to wear that on Shabbos. Here we've got some from the Alter Rebbe, Sheikh Noruch, Simen Shin Aleph, Seif, Chof Hei, Mute Lotzeis Bemine Asabim, Shekoishlim Oysom Bikshorim. You're allowed to wear kind of herbs, which are tied with Toilin Oysom Betzavar, which are hung uh, uh, from the neck, the refuah. The Eine Kemasri, don't look at it as, a, as you're carrying something. It's not you're carrying these things. This is something like a piece of jewelry which you wear to enhance your, your person. So to hear these grasses, which are somehow a protection, since they are for healing, therefore that's okay. And then he goes on to the Kamea idea. And it's all the same idea. Something which you are wearing to protect you now, that is called a tachshit, and therefore it's mutter to wear in the street on Shabbos. Let's go on to our next question. So someone asked me the, uh, the following. You're traveling on a plane and you lie down. You're lucky you got some, some empty seats. And what about Negelvasi? So... As I say, if you're very lucky, usually you don't really sleep very well on a plane. You get you nod off a bit here and there. You can't really call that a shinas, shinas kva. But let's say you are uh, fortunate to be able to sleep properly for a few hours on the plane. What's the story? So, of course, if you can prepare negrasa next to your place, um, you know, tovelech abrocha. And if you're lucky, it's still there when you when you wake up. But really, I, I, I was thinking about this, that there's not a problem of, you know, we have an issue of not walking to Aldamas. We don't walk to Aldamas. Really, we have been even more machmed that we make sure not to even to step down off the bed before before Nagalvasa, we have a postuk a smach yisriatze val derech leitoiv rola yimos. The person puts down their feet in a not a good way, then they won't despise evil during the day. So we we try to mosh Nagalvasa even before we leave our bed, but within Dal Damas. Now here's an interesting question. You know that if you go beyond the Yotchum Shabbos. So you're not allowed to walk beyond your Dal Damas. What would be if you're on a boat and it's traveling? Are you, a, what's the story there? Do you, well, if you look at a GPS, you are moving the whole time. You can say in relation to the boat, I haven't moved. I'm still within the Dal Damas of the boat, but in the absolute terms, you are moving the whole time. So here, this is actually from Alter Rebbe Shukhanaro in Simon Tov Hei. 
Sif Zion. And he's talking about a person who's on the boat and he has an issue of Dal Damas because he's going to be on the Tchum. And he says, That's if the boat is stationary. If the boat is moving, you can, you're allowed to move, walk around the whole boat. And he tells us, What's the issue? You mustn't move from your Dal Damas. You know what? I've got a secret for you. You're moving more than Dal Damas the whole time because the, 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 the way the speed, the ship is moving. You're moving from your original Dal Damas. And when you move to another Dal Damas, you have another Dal Damas from there. If you were forcibly taken from one place to the other. So you've got Dal Damas for your new location. If Goyim had forced you out of your Dal Damas, put you somewhere else. So you now have a new a new radius of Dal Damas. So what he's saying is when you're on a boat, you're moving the whole time. And therefore you don't have really a dedicated Dal Damas. And therefore you can keep on moving on the boat. So I would say the same thing with on the plane. You never, you never got Dal Damas. You say you, you mustn't move out your Dal Damas. You don't have Dal Damas. You're, you're, you're moving out the whole, moving the whole time. So therefore, it's a, it might sound a bit of a chiddush, but I think according to what we just said, the, this proof from Inyavir Erevin, you don't have to worry about Dal Damas on the plane. Uh, where do you wash Nagawasa? Oh, we've perhaps discussed this before. The best, uh, you know, the only option you really have is to use the bathroom in the in the uh, plane. Um, I don't think there's much of a choice about it. And um, just, I'd say, lower down the cover of the toilet seat so that you shouldn't be an issue of, uh, to minimize the exposure to a mockum of tumor. But that's the best you can do. Unless, of course, you have a bottle of, of water, drinking water and you wash in a bowl somewhere else in, in the plane. Of course, uh, you, that's a possibility. But fine. Let's go on to, um, following on from this Negovasa, as like someone who's learning the halachas of Negovasa, what about if someone had a, a blood sample taken? Now, it does say in Shukhan Aruch, in Kitsa Shukhan Aruch, that one of the things which warrant Negovasa is bloodletting. It used to be much more popular. People would go to a, used to call them a barber because they used to prick them with barbs. And the barber would do a bloodletting and that was for health. And it says that we should, it's, uh, one should wash Negovasa after doing so. That's written in Shukhanoch. So the person was asking, what about if you had a blood sample taken, because not had a cut, they donated blood. These are all different situations. So here we have from the Sefer Piskei Shuvis. And he says that it's only hamak is dam. And this principle, which I mentioned a few times in the shiurim, when, when we talk about the, all of these in Yonim Sgulim, this Ruach Ro, this kind of spiritual stuff, so then we only follow what we know for, for clear. Therefore, one not, doesn't need to do an after a Yadayim uh, after giving a blood sample for, 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 uh, for some of the checkup. And nor if you even though donate blood, some are machmir about that. And if you had blood from a, uh, from a wound, for sure there's no need to uh, do until you die after that. It seems to be it's more when, you, when a person voluntarily is taking blood for particularly for, uh, for a health issue, for whether it was, it was understood to be uh, good for the recycler, for the, how do you say, for the cycle of the blood, whatever. So for that, you would wash Negovasa. But for these other things, I was, for me, it was a shikol chiddush. Even if it's donating blood, he also says you don't need to take, I don't need to wash nagelvase. But probably on this is where those are machmir or machmir. Okay. Now here, someone asked me this question, and now this is the second time I'm doing this, but uh, I, I told him the wrong thing. A person asked, he had bought new premises. No, well, for him it was new. And um, there had it was somewhere in uh, somewhere in Brooklyn, and there had been he bought a, like a, a warehouse. In the warehouse, the previous owners or some at some earlier stage, they had a matzah oven, and just once a year, era Pesach, they would uh, bake matzahs there in the like this corner of the warehouse. 
Now he has no, no, no use for this oven. Is an issue of re removing the oven. Now, we have discussed this before as the in of Ruach Ra to block a window, to block a door. And when we do need to do so, we would leave a vent open that it shouldn't be totally blocked. So my impression was that the issue of removing an oven is also because of the chimney, which is connecting one floor to the other, like you don't block a door and you don't block a window, you don't block a, a, a chimney. Turns out I had made a mistake. And so I want to share that with you. So the source is from Tzavos of Yudah Chosid. And he writes the following, A person should not demolish a stove, an oven, which is used for baking, to use that same spot for something else. Rather, you should see to, you want to fix it, fix it, but don't, don't demolish it. And this is no, frightening stuff. He says it's Sakona Gedoyla. So it's much more than just the issue of, of uh, because of the chimney. He says it's Sakona Gedoyla. In the back of my mind, I remember that the Rebbe Rashab had a bit of discussion about this. And actually, there's three or four letters of the Rebbe Rashab. They've been published, his halacha writings have been published in the Sefer Torah Shalom. And so in Simon Lamed Vov, he was, the Rebbe Rashab was asked about somebody in Lubavitch about uh, removing a, a, an oven. And it was, it, he does point out that we're talking about an oven which is used for baking. That's what the, he says clearly. The, the, it's an oven used for baking. What had happened, it looked like in Lubavitch they had been doing some, some uh, rebuilding or something, and an oven had been removed, a baking oven had been removed. And the Rebbe Rashab says, if instead of the baking oven, they put there a stove for a, a ruha, ruba. Ruba is like the uh, oven, which is for heating the house rather than for cooking. Then it looks like there was a story with the Rebbe, with the time of the Temach Tzedek or the Alta Rebbe, that they had removed an, uh, a, sto an, a stove, a cooking stove, and the Rebbe didn't, the middle Rebbe, I believe, didn't want to use the room at all, didn't want to use the area. And so here he's saying, if, You've taken out a baking oven and you put instead a stove to heat the house, one can be more lenient to use the room. If the stove for heating the house is not exactly in the place where the baking oven was, it's a bit further down, even with Dal Damas, he's not so happy to rely on that, to say you've replaced it. There is this idea that the very location where there was the oven should not be used for another oven, for another purpose. Are you saying that the chimney of the oven is staying in place? That's irrelevant. So here I saw this, I realized I'd made a mistake. That the fact that you that the chimney is still there and hasn't been blocked, that's that's a separate issue. There's an issue of uh, a sakon of removing the oven. And here you have, what you have in front of you is the, the full body of the letter of the Rebbe Rashab, and he talks about the various places, the idea of, of an oven in Tanakh is uh, alluding to the Sitra Achre and the Yetzahara, and sometimes refers to Gehenna, and then he has a whole, a whole list of stuff. And um, because towards the end, uh, he recurs from the, that the word Tanur is the same letters as the word Noiter. Ki Ois Tov is interchangeable with Tes. 
So noite and not noite, as you know, is is not a not a very good middle. It means that the, you bear you bear a grudge against someone. That's called netira. So overall, it's quite. If you read this more carefully, you'll see it's quite um, discouraging to undertake this. And we saw this lost of the sefer Rabbi Rabbi Buda Chosid Sakona Gdoilo So I uh, once I saw this, I contacted the this fellow in in Brooklyn and told him to hold fire before he demolishes it. The Indian of Sakona, I'd like to look at it much more carefully. The only the only mitigating factor I could see is that this oven hasn't been used in this, our case, hadn't been used in 10 years or something. And I see that some of the posts can make that um, as grounds to be made called to demolish because it's not being used. The lost was Tana an oven which is actually in use, whereas this is quite out of use. To, uh, still not so... Uh, not so confident with that. Well, let's move on to the next question. So someone's been learning about Hichas Brochus, and sent a few questions. Spaghetti bolognese. Now, for the Amaratim like me, uh, um, spaghetti is, as we know, is, is, is long Italian lakshan. And then Bologna is a town in Italy, but somehow the, uh, there's become a name. If you take meatballs, and you put them together with spaghetti, that's called spaghetti bolognese. Oh, so, naya uh, 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 Does it, is it such a good shidduch that becomes one entity or two separate entities? One brocha, two brochas. So let's take a look. In the Altarebis, he said, and he starts about. Little pieces, little pieces, and the meat are like one. Ah, oh, uh, I'm I'm corrected that the spaghetti bolognese is actually the um, the meat is small pieces and mixed in, which makes a very big difference, la locha, Because the one who wrote to me wrote to me that yeah, that they put the spaghetti separate and the ball separate. And if it, if it, so, this makes all the difference, and that is. Where we have the Loshan Taroivis Shne Minim Shein Moirov and Yacht. If you got a mixture of two species, two types of food, and he adds Shein Moirov and Yacht, that they are mixed with one another, the Embech and Shavas have different brochas. So then we go Iker and Tofel, and then we have, um, if you don't, can't decide what is the Iker and what's the Tofel, so then you'd say that they go according to the majority. And then we have another thing that Mazoinus always becomes the dominant feature. That's a bit further on. But So let's make it clear. If, there's, if it's just meatballs and spaghetti and they happen to be sitting in one plate, then it's for sure that's not called a tarevis. It's two separate things. Like they are quite distinct. And you make two brochas, one on the... On the uh, Spaghetti, and then you make a separate brocha on the meatballs. But if, as I'm just being told, that they are mixed well, so then we would say that the the mizonis, it's, it's just mizonis, it's one food, it's 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 a food, it's a mizonis food which has mixed in it bits of something else of of of, of meat. So then that would be just the brocha of bere min mizonis, which brings us to the next question about a stir fry with vegetables and pieces of chicken. Is it shahakal or adomo or both? So, so if it's, it, we have to, 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 to answer this question, we have to decide, is this a tarevis? Is this a mixture? Then you'd go, the bracha would be on the majority, uh, unless it's misogynist, which it always becomes a dominant one. Is it a mixture? How do you define what is a mixture, what isn't? So some contemporary poskim want to suggest that they do use this uh, criterion. When you pick up a spoonful, isn't it almost inevitable that you're going to have both species, going to have chicken and vegetables in each spoonful? And I mean, I'm not saying every one, but if that's the expectation, then that would be considered a mixture 
and you'd make and they, they cook together and so you'd make one bracha um on, on uh for that combination if i'm not mistaken the bracha would be would be hardomo because that would be the majority there's a separate thing about soup so that the meat becomes the ikir but i don't think that applies over here have to think about it okay um this is a note from the from the uh, editor of the new edition of Seder Birchus Anenin. He says that when we're talking, we, he emphasizes that they are mixed together, whether they're cooked or even if they were mixed without cooking, like a salad of different types. But if there's uh, a majority of one, so then but that becomes the, the deciding uh, feature. So now comes the next question about frosting on a cake. Now, if you have an eir kichel with herring, you don't make two brochas. You don't make a brocha on the, on, on the chopped herring. You make a brocha just on the eir kichel. Because a, when you're having a, a, a piece of mazonis, you have a piece of cream cake. You don't make a separate brocha on the cream because it's toffle to the bit of pastry to the cake. That's true. But what is this story if you have a piece of cream cake, let's say? Do you make a ala michio or very nefoshes? How does it work? Because very often, depending on how, how, how much your appetite for cream cake is, but very often you may have just a very small amount of mazonis and a large amount of cream. So the brocha was mazonis, but it comes to ala michio. You didn't have a kazais. Now let's get this clear. If we've gone through this perhaps before, you have, you pick a piece of cake, a, a significant proportion of that piece of cake is sugar or some other flavoring. And I've said this very clear that, that the brocha is mazoinus and alamichio for a kazais, let's say chocolate brownies. A kazais of chocolate brownie has to have ala michio. And we know that a third, two thirds of the chocolate brownie is not flour. It doesn't matter. So long as it's, uh, the ratio is not, is what is of the grain is one to six. So then it becomes, the whole thing becomes ala michio. So a chocolate brownie, a kazais of chocolate brownie is ala michio. When you have frosting on top of a cake or the cream on top of a cake, they are, it's not, it's not the same. They, they, they're separate entities. They'll be sitting one on top of the other. So the cream is toffled to the cake, but it doesn't really become cake. And as a result, you'd have to make, uh, you'd have to, you'd have, you, you wouldn't be able to make al hamichyo based upon the frosting. I just want to show you something. Bear with me a minute. I want to show you something. <clears throat> The reason why we're doing this as a pre-recording is because I was traveling. So I took with, this is not an advertisement, I took with me these, these biscuits. And they are made of two round biscuits. And in between, there's a layer of cream, as you can see in the label. And it's, cut, it's coated with chocolate on the outside. The weight says 30 grams. 1.05 ounces. So if I have just one packet like this, do I make a al hamichio or not? And I made al hamichio, and I'll tell you why. Because, not because the chocolate makes up the shear, because as I've just said, the chocolate does not combine to the shear. How much is a kazais? Kazais doesn't go according to weight, it goes according to volume. And think about a matchbox. So you perhaps even a, a regular matchbox. What would fill up a matchbox? That volume is the volume of a kazais. So two round biscuits of this size would easily, their volume would fill up a match. I'm not talking about making the powder. The volume as they are, they would fill up a matchbox. And therefore, 
never mind the cream the, uh, in the middle, middle, never mind the chocolate on the outside. I felt that the actual two biscuits have the volume of a kazais. That's, therefore, I'm going back. But if it would taka be just a, uh, a piece of small amount of cake and a, and a generous amount of frosting, cream, etc., you would not be able to say alamichya unless there is a kazais of cake. If there isn't a kazais of cake, and if there's a kazais of cream, it's um, it's uh, foshes. If it's half a kazais of, of cake, and let's say half a kazais of cream, so you'd go according to the lower denominator, and that brocha chren would be foshes. So let's say in the case of this this biscuit, if I would have half of this, I don't know, I don't know whether that would be a kazais. Um, even with the chocolate, but let's say if there was such a kind of combination and I don't have a kazais of pastry only with the extra uh, features, so then it would go down, if, and they are bernafoshes, so it would be bernafoshes. So we also had another question on this list, they, uh, the, the spinach salad with mango, pieces of mango, and I think spinach salad is basically uh, a very prihadoma food. And why would you put in some people pomegranates or palm, uh, seeds or mango? You want to give it a certain sweetness or something. But I think the pieces of mango in a spinach salad are there, they're tofu. It's not that you're eating mango for, you're having spinach. And you put in something to give it a bit more flavor. And therefore, I would say it remains very prihadoma. Finally, we have a question about one of our, our listeners, he listens to the, to the recording, and he asked me to clarify something, which uh, I thought is a double haposhet, but it seems to be uh, uh, not so well known. We know that the Torah asks, forbids us to charge interest. Now, what would happen if someone comes to me, uh, let's do the name, name name's Ruben and Shimon, Reuven needs to buy something and he doesn't have the money. So he goes over to Shimon and he says, Shimon, can you lend me money? I want you to buy uh, uh, this and this thing. Shimon says, I don't have the money in cash. I can use it my credit card. So now, as we know, credit card, if you don't pay in time, is a very expensive way of borrowing money. So Reuven borrowed Shimon's credit card. Oh, no, Reuben, Reuben lent Shimon the use of the Shimon. Shimon is the borrower, and Shimon didn't pay on time. So now Reuben is now being charged interest by the lender, by the bank, on a monthly basis. And Shimon feels very bad because he borrowed 100 pounds. Now it's costing Reuben 120 pounds. That wasn't what he was planning. He was planning to pay him on time. May Shimon reimburse Reuven for the, for the fact that he was out of pocket? The basic answer is no, because there's two transactions here. There's a transaction between Reuven and Shimon, and there's a transaction between Reuven and the bank. The, the borrowing from the bank, of course, the bank is, allowed, is a Goisha bank. They're allowed to charge interest. But for Reuven to pass on the charges, to Shimon, because um, because of the delay of payment, therefore Shimon is paying extra. That would come into the issue of ribis. That is not okay. You're not allowed to, even though uh, it's the charges are clearly caused by Shimon, but uh, Shimon may not reimburse Reuven for um, for the charges which Reuven incurred because he lent Shimon the use of his, his credit card. Sometimes people have asked me. Can, can, if Reuven would ask, can he use Meister money to settle the bill? That might be, that might be, uh, it's a Tzayach Mitzvah, whatever you want to use it, you can use Meister money to Tzayach Mitzvah. But let's just read this in the Taz, where we got this um, sack from, Simen Yerdea Kofayin Gimel, Sif, Sif Kotten Gimel. Misha Oisis Kasha Sim Chaveir, Shem Lei Shalom Lei Chaveir, Zman Mugbul, Shem Shalom Lei Kola Zekas Shalei, Mamal Ve Loi Vimokim, 
the, the, bar, the lender borrowed the money from somewhere else at interest. The, the fact that the malva has to, the lender has to pay extra to his lender, that the loyva is, the, is not got no liability for that. Gam Haloiva Khan Khaiwazek is going into some 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 proof to this. Um and third line from the bottom. Vafilum hisno ime befadish shayikah mois al revach beheter, who you shall moisum. Even if clearly the agreement between Reuven and Shimon was that Reuven would borrow money with a permitted way of charging interest. And then Shimad would reimburse him. Yes, Bozaisuribis. And even if it had been paid, he'd have to pay it back. That's what the Taz writes. So that's where we come we come from. That you wouldn't be allowed to pass on those charges and uh, to find ways around it. All right, I'll wish you all a good and Shabbos and uh Freil Kantomit, and we should meet with one another in good health. Asoyvas Mochis called.